Well, today is the last uh, Sunday that we read of, hear of, uh, the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Next Sunday uh, from John chapter 10, uh, the focus is on the Good Shepherd, Christ present in his church, Christ guiding his sheep. And then, uh, it's another story, then the Gospels go elsewhere for the last three Sundays of Eastertide. So today, uh, this appearance of Jesus to the two guys on the road. Well, in Lent, uh, we talk a lot about changing, uh, conversion, to use the biblical word. We're reminded uh, life is short, death is certain, and after death comes judgment. Now, whether we really change for the better during Lent, uh, well, it's a moot point, isn't it? Uh, am I less impatient? Uh, am I more generous at the end of it all? Uh, well, well, there we are. But in the Easter stories, in Jesus' appearances, and the, about eight or so of them feature in the Gospels, we do see change happening. It's as if the Lord decides to do what we have failed to do. The Easter Gospels are all about transformation. Uh, think of Mary Magdalene weeping outside the tomb, turning, turning to someone she thinks is the gardener, turning again, in another sense, to recognize who he is, and then running, running to tell the others, turning and running. Think of Thomas, grumpy, stubborn Thomas, changing from unbelief to a blazing profession of faith, my Lord and my God. Think of our two guys today. At the beginning, they're, tramp they, they're tramping along, faces downcast as the gospel, shoulders slumped. It's easy to imagine. At the end of the story, they literally turn round they go back to Jerusalem, and they must have run. They turn round physically because they have been turned from disillusionment to recognition, because their hearts have burned and their eyes have opened. Uh, just a little note, a footnote there, really. You know, their disillusionment, we had hoped, but it's all worked out wrong. It hasn't come true. Their disillusionment was actually an illusion. Uh, we often think we're being very adult when we're being disillusioned, but maybe there's a little caution there. We may just be wrong. And then when they find the 11 and their companions, they meet more changed people. Yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Or again, think of Peter after that breakfast on the beach. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times. Well, what kind of man came out of that conversation? Not the same one as went into it. All changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Now, those are famous lines from uh, William Butler Yeats's poem, Easter 1916 about the Easter Rising in Dublin that year. It's a poem that shows ordinary people being changed by the desire for the freedom of their country. Suddenly they have something to care about passionately, even to fight for. And he describes different characters and how they are changed. He describes a man, among others, whom he thought a drunken, vainglorious lout, who had done most bitter wrong, in fact, uh, to a friend of Yeats's. But even he, he too, like other characters in the poem, is transfigured. He too, says the poem, has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too <clears throat> has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That's the refrain of the poem. A terrible beauty is born. Well, the Gospels recount, as it were, 
the first Easter rising. One by one, two by two, then as eleven and their companions, disciples are being changed. They resign their part in the casual comedy of everyday life. For them, in any case, it had already ceased to be either comic or casual. They had him crucified, and we had hoped. And then a terrible beauty is born for them. It's born from the womb of the tomb. It's born in them. It's beautiful because it's Christ. It's terrible because it utterly transforms asking not less than everything. Were not our hearts burning within us as he talked to us on the road, albeit in different ways, at different paces, this beauty burns both hearts and lives. There's a terrible beauty about having a purpose in life and sharing in the mission of Christ. It's a beauty meant to kindle and transfigure the world. What is conversion? Well, if we've done our, our catechetics or listened to enough sermons, uh, we will <clears throat> know the Greek word for it, metanoia. Now, this is what Lent so uh, urgently encourages. And what does metanoia mean? It means having second thoughts, a change of mind, thinking again, thinking twice about something, about the way we live our lives, for example. It may be grief at something good having passed us by. Now, literally, metanoia is an aftermind. We don't exactly have that phrase in English, but an after. Meta is after, noia is mind. It's having an aftermind. Now, what Lent encourages, with greater or lesser success, Easter actually brings about. Uh, St. Peter's Pentecost sermon, of which we heard uh, something in the first reading, is a call to the people of Jerusalem to think again, to have an aftermind regarding what they had done to Jesus. You killed him, says Peter. That's pretty blunt. But God raised him to life. You misjudged him, misread him. But God reversed your judgment. God's aftermind. Take it on, he says. That's faith. You foolish men, so slow of heart to believe, <clears throat> says Jesus to the two on the road. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and enter into his glory? Uh, we talk often, don't we, of life after this or that, well, life after death, I suppose, life after cancer, life after retirement, life after bereavement. We're all thinking uh, about life after lockdown. Christianity, faith, hope, charity, is life after the resurrection. It's an aftermind, an afterlife. We can't see anything now in quite the same light. If resurrection is where it's all heading, the whole road, life's road, looks different. We have to resign our part in the casual comedy, give up the nonsense. We have to turn towards Jerusalem. In the first Eastertide, after his passion, says St. Luke, Jesus presented himself alive by many proofs, appearing to them. God allowed him to be seen, says Peter elsewhere. So the initiative is on God's side. Uh, even humanly, uh, we are changed. We become alive. We find a reason for living, often thanks to other people and the inspiration that they give. They can be instruments of God. And so here, Christ who has been transformed by the glory of the Father <clears throat> in the mystery of his resurrection, transforms those he comes to. From the Easter candle, here it is, from the Easter candle, other candles take their light. First the apostles, and then down 
even to us. He appears in the garden, on the road, by the shore after their fishing, on a hillside, well, actually in a pub in today's reading, really, in an upper room at the breaking of bread. Uh, it's good to remember, while churches are closed, the many other places he can also appear. And it's he who transforms, he who converts, he who conveys the aftermind, God's aftermind. It is the living one who, wants, uh, who makes us want to live. He showed himself alive, says Luke. He has come to us in our baptism and our confirmation, in the sacrament of matrimony, perhaps. He comes in his word. He comes in this person, that person. He comes with his cross and resurrection, sorrows and joy. He walks the road alongside us, even if our eyes are closed. All changed, changed utterly. He too, says Yeats, well, to coin a phrase, we might say, me too. There is now a terrible beauty around. Let's ask for it to show itself. Gently, please, and give us burning hearts, wide open eyes, and flying feet. <laughs>